Hello and welcome to EarlyMusicSources.com. My name is Elam Rotem, and today I'm happy to introduce to you our recent English translation and edition of Lorenzo Penna's Basso Continuo Treatise. With respect to Basso Continuo Treatises, the second half of the 17th century in Italy is not rich with sources. Apart from a short treatise by Bartolomeo Vismantova, the two substantial sources are the anonymous treatise we translated as by volume 1 and Lorenzo Penna's treatise we are publishing now. These sources are fascinating, giving us a glimpse into extraordinary practices that are not recorded in any other sources. In this episode, I will present to you Penna's fascinating treatise. Let's start. Penna published his treatise in 1672 in Bologna. Its title implies that it is meant for beginners. It includes three parts or books. The first is about canto figurato, essentially the basics of mensural music. The musical system, note names, solmization, clefs, note values, ligatures, mensural signs, basic diminutions, and some general tips for beginner singers. The second book is about counterpoint. The consonances and dissonances, how to proceed from one interval to another, how to employ dissonances, imitations, guidelines to writing in two, three, four, five, and two more voices, invertible counterpoint, canons, modes, cadences, and the very basics of basso continuo. Only after presenting all of this comes the third part, dedicated fully to basso continuo, the fundaments of playing the organ or harpsichord upon a part. Putting this as the third part of his treatise allows Penna to be sure that the beginner basso continuo student is already experienced in singing and knows sufficient counterpoint. The book, probably due to success in sales, was reprinted several times, with the fifth edition published after Penna's death. Some editions are said to have been revised and enhanced by the author. We will mention later some of the very interesting revisions made by Penna. Due to the rather large size of this treatise, for now we could only translate and edit the third book about Basso Continuo. On this occasion I'd like to thank all our Patreon supporters. It is thanks to you that we were able to finance this modest edition. Thank you very much. Now, let's have a look at some very interesting things we found in this treatise. Since Italian basso continuo sources mostly refer to music that has no or very few figures above its basso continuo part, they are mainly concerned with helping the player decide which figures or intervals should be played above the part. We see this from the very first treatises, where Bianciardi, for example, shows in which progressions one should use a major chord or a minor chord, and where one should use a sixth, etc. And we still see it a century later, in the 18th century, with Gasparini, for example, who just shows more bass progressions and with which figures they should be accompanied. Penna, however, is not satisfied with merely revealing which figures should be used when. For every example, he adds a realization entitled Pratica, showing how it is done in practice. What's more, sometimes he even expands on it, showing one realization with pure notes, and then another one ornamented with extravagant trills. As you can see, the in-practice realizations are notated in an interesting manner, mostly in a score of three parts. This is not to imply that realizations should be made using only three parts, this is very clear from the text. As we will show later, Penna calls for the addition of further consonances when playing. Moreover, sometimes, in addition to the written parts, further figures are added, implying more specifically which notes should be added. For example here, in the realization of what we call on this channel an authentic four-step cadence, Penna adds two figures that are not represented by notes, a minor seventh and a very surprising minor ninth. Let's first hear what only the written three parts sound like. Now, let's add some more consonances in general, and specifically those added by Penna.
The minor 7th at the end of a cadence is something we sometimes see in compositions already from the beginning of the 17th century. The minor 9th, however, is not. It is something, it seems, that is found only in the realm of performance practice of basso continuo, and is described only in this treatise by Penna. Then, on top of this, Penna also includes an additional realization with trills, made with four parts and additional figures. I'm actually not at all sure how these trills should be executed. You are welcome to give it a go yourself. But regardless of the trills, frustratingly, this short score notation is sometimes a bit ambiguous. A more accurate notation for these realizations would have been a keyboard intavolatura, the 16th and 17th century equivalent for the modern keyboard score. But the printing of intavolature, whether with movable type or engraving techniques, was rare and complicated in the second half of the 17th century in Italy. This fact was probably what made Penna choose this special notation solution. For your convenience, in some cases we added possible realizations in a modern keyboard score in our edition. Penna's very first rule in the very first chapter is that one's playing is to be full of harmonious consonances, that is to say, the unison, third, fifth or sixth, octave, and their doublings. In the 1684 edition, and consequently also in 1696, he reiterated this advice in similar statements throughout the treatise. For example, when describing what we call on this channel a two-step tenor cadence, he added a sentence stating that the seventh and the sixth should be accompanied with all the possible consonances, the octave, tenth, and twelfth, or their doublings, as this makes for a very good effect. He was not satisfied by only stating this in the text. He also added more figures above his examples, to support this wish for fuller and richer realizations. Closer to the end of the treatise in the later editions, he added the following paragraph. The student should note the universal rule that to all dissonances one can, even must, add the thirds, fifth, octaves and their doublings to the written note, playing everything together, all the more so when the composition has many voices. This is a very clear description of what is commonly referred to as playing full on the harpsichord. What is not so clear is whether Penna's taste changed over the years, perhaps implying a developing taste for playing full, or that he just made his original idea clearer in the revised editions. Penna's attitude towards parallel intervals might surprise us. He writes rather softly that parallel octaves and fifths are to be avoided, and that this rule speaks principally of the outer parts. He shows an example where parallel octaves and fifths are found between the outer parts and marks it as bad. In some other examples, however, we find parallels involving the inner parts, as in this case between the tenor and soprano. Penna could have easily avoided this, or even corrected it in one of the editions, but it seems like that this was really not so important to him. Indeed, when playing full, with many notes, the individual movement of the inner voices is very much obscured, to the point that unless the parallels are between the outer voices, they are not evident to the listener. Notice that this license only refers to playing basso continuo. In compositions, all the parts should avoid such parallels. Penna demonstrates an easy way, mentioned often by theoreticians, of adding consonances over a bass. Simply add tenth above it. For example, when ascending, you put the tenth in the top voice and use fifths and sixths in the inner part. Or very similarly, when descending. He also explains that when the bass proceeds with whole notes, 
it must always be interrupted by one of the other parts with half notes, as he did in these two examples. Another useful tip is that when the bass has a dotted note, that dot must similarly be interrupted in at least one part with another note. He demonstrates it with this beautiful example. You might surprisingly realize that you have already heard it elsewhere. Pena presents a remarkable pedagogical tool that he calls the Ruota delle Cadenze, the Wheel of Cadences. It's basically a sequence of cadences that goes through all the possible keys and finishes at the starting note. He explains that by using this tool, the student will easily master all the cadences. He uses it for each of the four kinds of cadences that he presents. Curiously, instead of naming the cadences, he numbers them. The first is what we call an authentic cadence. The second is what we call a plagal cadence. The third is what we call a tenor cadence. And the fourth is what we call a soprano cadence. Indeed, going around the wheel of each of these cadences will make sure you and your fingers know them very well. Interestingly, he divides the wheels into areas with more flats and areas with more sharps, and specifically notes those cadences that may be played either with flats or sharps, as they are enharmonically equivalent. Such a presentation of practically all the possible keys on the keyboard is a clear indication that already in 1672, musicians were using temperaments that enabled the use of all the keys. That is, that they moved away from the Mintone family of temperaments and use what we call irregular temperaments or well-tempered temperaments. This was just a taste of what Pena's treatise has to offer. Feel free to check out the new translation, practice your drills and go around the wheel of cadences. We promise you'll learn something. I'd like to thank Freddie James for translating the texts of this treatise, and Yason Marmaras for beautifully typesetting the music examples. If you enjoy early music sources and would like us to continue our work, consider supporting us on Patreon. Comment, share and like. See you next time at earlymusicsources.com.